January 19th, 1922, University of Toronto. Day and night, for 11 days, James Collop has been in the lab, preparing sample after sample of a hormone taken from beef pancreas. His team hopes this will save thousands of children a year, but in truth, it's one specific child Collop is trying to save. And it's a race. Lying in bed at a Toronto General Hospital is 14-year-old Leonard Thompson. At the time of his admission one month before, he weighed only 65 pounds. Thompson has diabetes, a condition that, in 1921, offers children no future except a slow and painful death. The rest of the team, especially Dr. Banting, is breathing down Collip's neck. His last attempt at an extract had proved too impure, and Thomas had an allergic reaction. But now, this time, Collip thinks he's nailed it. When he tests the blood sugar of an injected rabbit, he finds it dropped. Finally a breakthrough! He's closing in on the mysterious hormone known as insulin. This episode is brought to you by the Child and Teen Checkups Program of Minnesota. Childhood obesity and diabetes are on the rise, but they're preventable, and children from birth to age 21 may even qualify for free checkups. Learn more at u21checkups.com. Diabetes mellitus is a condition that's so old, it was known even in ancient Egypt. But there was no known treatment until the late 19th century. Even then, all doctors could offer were starvation diets, a regimen where a patient was allowed nothing but coffee with whiskey to dull the pain, and then gradually, food was added slowly until their urine showed an acceptable glucose or sugar level. Today, we know that diabetes is a long-lasting health condition that affects how the body turns food into energy. It causes high levels of glucose in the blood and can damage the kidneys, heart, and eyes. But by the turn of the century, doctors were only starting to understand that. Also at the time, they didn't know that there were two types of diabetes. Adults typically have type 2 diabetes, which can be caused by obesity. So in that case, losing weight did alleviate some of the symptoms. But children usually had type 1 diabetes. And for them, starvation diets were dangerous, since children need calories to build and grow their bodies and really have none to spare. And while limiting their food intake could slow death from kidney damage, fluid in the lungs, and eventual coma, most kids still only lived six months to a year a year in which they wasted away in diabetic wards, their parents mourning by their bedside, before their children were even gone. But Dr. Frederick Banting thought he might be able to change all that. Banting was a farm boy born in Ontario, Canada. He was also a surgeon, having completed an accelerated medical degree in order to serve in an ambulance unit in World War I, where he was awarded the Military Cross. But he wasn't a researcher. So when he came to Dr. John James Rickard McLeod, the University of Toronto's foremost diabetes expert, and proposed an experiment, he got a chilly reception. Banting had read an article about how to keep the islets of Langerhans, which are groups of specialized cells in the pancreas, available for study without damaging them. And this was important because the islets had been suggested as the home of a substance called insulin, which was thought to have a role in diabetes. Now, just pausing here for a moment, this next bit will discuss surgical experiments performed on animals that were, even then, considered cruel. So, if you'd prefer to skip these specific details, please jump ahead around 20 seconds. Banting laid out his plan. They would get a healthy dog and surgically tie off the eyelets of Langerhans, keeping them alive, but letting the rest of the pancreas die off. Then, they would let the insulin build up, create an extract from the islets, and inject it into another dog that had been artificially given diabetes by the removal of its pancreas, all while they would monitor its glucose. McLeod was unconvinced. It had been tried by better doctors than Banting, who in his eyes was little more than a military surgeon that had no research experience or even an advanced degree. In fact, it took him three meetings before Banting badgered McLeod into sponsoring the experiment. McLeod gave Banting the use of the laboratory and an undergraduate, Charles Best, as his assistant, and thus began one of the most drama-prone research teams in history. And a lot of that was due to Banting and McLeod being fantastically mismatched. McLeod thought Banting was ill-prepared, with a shallow textbook knowledge of the pancreas. He felt the military surgeon kept botching the experiments. Meanwhile, Banting felt McLeod was undermining him by not giving him enough money for the project. Neither Banting or Best were paid, the lab space was dirty, and there was no money to hire an assistant to take care of the dogs. After several dogs died, Banting and Best were forced to start buying new experimentation dogs on the black market. But despite everything, they got results. And after showing they could use pancreas extract to help with diabetes in dogs, McLeod upped their funding. He also allowed Banting to bring in a fourth researcher, James Collip, to purify the extract. 
Plus, they made a further breakthrough when they found they could extract insulin from whole beef pancreas bought from slaughterhouses rather than the specially prepared dogs. Still, instead of publishing the results right away, McLeod made them run the dog experiments again and again. This made Banting furious, and he threatened to take his research to another facility, but McLeod wanted to be sure. And finally, once McLeod was satisfied with the repeated results, the discovery was announced in an article in 1921. It was a massive news event. Anxious parents clamored to get their diabetic children some of the new substance. But McLeod refused to move to human trials, partially over worries about Banting. Banting was a poor public speaker and not a diabetes specialist. Also, he stumbled during the Q&A portion of their first university lecture on the discovery, so there was that. This caused McLeod to increasingly insert himself in the press as the project's expert voice, making Banting think McLeod was stealing credit. They quarreled again, and embarrassingly, despite his eagerness for a human trial, Banting wasn't even qualified to run the experiments on patients. But at last, the data convinced McLeod a human trial could begin. Though due to Banting's lack of qualifications, it was doctors at the hospital that were assigned to administer the insulin, not Banting. Toronto General Hospital, January 11th, 1922. Leonard Thompson is about to get the first ever dose of insulin. Banting is forced to wait in the hall with Best as the young doctor injects the insulin extract. The doctors tell them that there's no significant drop in glucose, which they test by checking Leonard's urine and he also developed swelling at the injection site, the kind of dangerous side effect that stops a treatment dead. That's when Collop steps in. The team believes the extract is just not pure enough, and Collop is the key to solving that. So, he works the problem day and night, developing a new process. And finally, on January 19th, all the late nights have paid off. He's managed to get pure insulin. But when Banting and Best ask Collop how he's done it, he refuses to tell them. See, while they've all agreed not to patent insulin, Collop argues that his purification method falls outside of that. Banting clenches his fists, and in an explosion of shouting, things get physical. Now, we don't know exactly what happened next, but Collop ended up on the floor, agreeing he would not profit off the discovery. And on January 23rd, Leonard Thompson gets his second purified injection of insulin. Within an hour, his blood sugar has dropped. He feels and looks instantly better. In a rush of excitement, they make more insulin, then take it to the diabetic ward where six children are lying in diabetic coma. And by the time they've ejected the sixth child, they can hear the first child's parents weeping and yelling in happiness as their son awakes. A miracle. A miracle Banting, McLeod, Best, and Collin sell to a Canadian government laboratory for the grand sum of one dollar. They resolve not to profit on this discovery, though all will get personal accolades with Banting becoming the most famous man in Canada. But that didn't stop their arguing. In fact, fame and recognition would only turn up the heat further. Because the story of insulin is not done. Because now that Banting, McLeod, Best, and Collop had discovered the miracle, they now had to find a way to mass-produce it. And since these four men, racked with jealousy, paranoia, ambition, and mutual dislike, were about to enter an all-out battle over credit for the discovery, the drama was just getting started. Once again, thanks so much to Child and Teen Checkup's program of Minnesota for sponsoring this series. You know, thanks to insulin, diabetes is now a manageable condition. In fact, it was recently estimated that there are over 15 million diabetics alive today that would have died at an earlier age without it. But due to the obesity crisis, diabetes is also on the rise among children. So you should talk to your doctor at your next Child and Teen Checkup's Well Child Check about your kid's diet and exercise, and how they can stay in a healthy weight range while also being physically fit and strong. Not to mention, Child and Teen Checkups also provides free mental health screenings for those under 21. You can learn more and see if your child qualifies for free checkups over at u21checkups.com. That's the letter U, 21, checkups.com. That's right, Zoe. Ahmed Zia Turk, Alicia Bramble, Casey Mustia, Dominic Valenciana, Joseph Blaine, Kyle Murgatroyd, and O'Reels One are fantastic legendary patrons. 